The scripture reading for this Ascension Sunday is from the first chapter of the book of Acts. Acts is really part two of the Gospel of Luke and was written by the same person. In Acts, the focus shifts from the human life of Jesus to how Jesus is active through humans. The Gospel of Luke ends 40 days after the resurrection with a description of how Jesus was taken up into the sky to be seen in human form no longer. The book of Acts then begins where the gospel left off, repeating the ascension scene with a little more detail, including the commissioning of the disciples to take up the work of Jesus. So, the beginning of the book of Acts. Luke writes, I produced an earlier treatise, O Theophilus, concerning everything Jesus initiated, both as a practice and as a teaching until the day when he was taken above, having issued instructions through a Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, to whom, after he had suffered, he showed himself alive by many irrefutable proofs being seen by them over a period of 40 days and telling them things about the kingdom of God. And meeting with the apostles, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but rather to await the promise of the Father, which you heard from me, because John indeed baptized of water, but you will be baptized in a spirit, the Holy One, not many days from now. So then, coming together, the apostles questioned Jesus, saying, Lord, are you reestablishing the kingdom of Israel at this time? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria even to the end of the earth. And saying these things, as they were watching, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud took him from their eyes. And as they were staring at him, ascending into the sky, behold, standing beside them were two men in white garments, who said, Galilean men, why do you stand looking at the sky? This Jesus, who has thus been taken up from you into the sky, will come in the way you saw him going to the sky. They returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Mount of the Olive Grove, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's walk away. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Let us pray. Most blessed God, we thank you this day for the wonder of gathering together, gathering together in the name of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead and raised even higher still, raised to sit at your right hand, to share love through all time with the world. We pray that you'll be with us now as we hear this ancient and foreign story, this story that strikes us as odd and yet is meant to give hope and life to us today. As we listen, bless us, be with us now and always. Amen. There are a lot of, well, let us say unusual stories in the Bible, of course. One of our former associate pastors, Jer Hyland, uh, some of you I'm sure remember him, was particularly, refond, was particularly fond of recounting 2 Kings chapter 2 where we hear about a bunch of children who were harassing the prophet Elisha, saying, hey, bald head, go away. 
go away, bald head. And Elisha then curses them and two she-bears. And yes, for some reason, the story does specify that they were female bears. Two she-bears come out of the woods and maul 40 children. Jer, of course, was the youth pastor, so it makes sense that he would want us to remember this story. The unusual story that I like to highlight comes from the book of Acts. Uh, just a few chapters, uh, five chapters later than the story that we heard today, when Ananias and Sapphira, two married, uh, a married couple, two disciples of Jesus, they sell a house, and instead of giving the full sum to the church, they hold back part of the proceeds. And Peter then says, what's the deal, Ananias? Why did you hold back some of the money? And Ananias promptly dies. And then Sapphira, uh, arriving a few moments later, coming into the room after her husband, um, is also asked, what the heck, Sapphira? And she also falls over dead. I guess um, it makes sense for me as the senior pastor, the one who handles stewardship in the church, to remind you of this story. But more to the point today, the story about the ascension of Jesus surely qualifies as one of the more unusual stories in the Bible. I actually remember hearing this story as a child and thinking, huh, what? After the resurrection, like, you know, I. I'd gotten this message in church. After the resurrection, Jesus is alive. And it's very clear in the Gospel of Luke, at least, that Jesus has a real physical body. Luke is the one who had Jesus eating fish and telling Thomas to touch the hole in his hand. And so this physically risen Jesus is just taken up into the sky? My 11-year-old mind was like, okay, most of the miracles in the Bible, they're one thing. They happened a long time ago, and now, 2,000 years later, they can't be disproven. You know, lucky for the Bible, right? But this one, if Jesus had a physical body and he went up into the sky then my 11-year-old mind wants to ask, like, okay, where's his body now? I mean, why aren't people looking for him? Let's go look for him. This is verifiable, people. We've got planes and satellites and spaceships. Come on, people, let's find him. If heaven is a place you can get to by going up, then it seems like Neil Armstrong should have had a pretty good view of the place when he went past. This doesn't make any sense to my 11-year-old mind. Now, I was not raised a fundamentalist, to be clear about this, so I was never taught to understand the Bible literally that it was literally, historically, scientifically true. But you know, an 11-year-old mind sitting there in church does try to fit things together. And in this case, things didn't fit together. The difference, though, between an 11-year-old fundamentalist and an 11-year-old liberal Lutheran is that when the 11-year-old fundamentalist thinks, this doesn't make any sense, the thought is followed by a sense of fear and perhaps even shame, while for the 11-year-old liberal Lutheran, the thought is followed by a sense of wonder and perhaps even curiosity. 
Through the years then, the questions that raced through my mind about this story changed from where is his body? To why aren't people looking for him? To why aren't people looking for him? To how was he raised up? To what does it mean to say he was raised up? So what's the point of saying Jesus was raised up? To what was Luke really trying to say here? To what are we supposed to learn about Jesus here? And that, I think, is a decent question to ask. What are we supposed to learn about Jesus from this unusual story? Now, I want to talk about three things today that I think we're supposed to learn about this story. You're welcome for having a nice three-point sermon. First, Jesus was done. He really had finished everything that he needed to do. He had given us everything that we needed to receive. He could ascend into the sky on this ascension day because he was done. Of course, we Christians tend to be less thrilled with what God has done and more bewildered by what God hasn't done. God has given us creation, given us life, given us divine friendship, restored that friendship over and over given us Jesus, given us forgiveness, given us a beautiful path to follow in life. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. You know, we take all of that stuff for granted. But then we ask, what about hunger? What about disasters? What about cancer? What about war? What about Kanye West? It's as if we're so mesmerized by, you know, what we learn in a modern economy, that everything is based in a transaction, this for that. It's as if we're so memorized by the market economy that we even see our relationship with God as a, a market transaction. And we feel that the contents of salvation aren't what we read on the Amazon page, and so we want our money back. All we can think of is what God hasn't given us. And into this litany, then, of what's wrong with God comes this day of ascension. Jesus went back to where he came from, because he was done. He's finished. He didn't hang around to work on a few odd jobs uh, at the edges of salvation. There was no more to do. Now, a lot of us rebel against this. Surely there is plenty left to do, unredeemed, plenty left unredeemed in the world. How can Jesus have finished? He taken the poison out of the sting of sin. He'd shown us the very heart of God. He'd broken through the wall of death. In other words, he'd done what only God could do. What matters most. And he left the rest to us. 
Maybe not such a bad deal. Salvation remains today what it was on Ascension Day. It's not a life lived without disappointment, a life without discomfort, not even a life without disillusionment, but a life with a faith to look back on, a hope to look forward to, and a life, a beautiful life to live in love. That's one thing to learn from the day of ascension is that Jesus was done because he'd done everything we truly needed. Second, I think we're supposed to learn here that the one who ascended is the same one who was crucified. That's why Luke makes such a point that the resurrected Jesus has a body, body with which he could eat fish and you could touch his wounds. Luke is not saying in this mode, see, this proves that Jesus was raised. Luke was saying, this proves that the one who was raised is the same one who was crucified. This one who was raised is the one who bore the full brunt of human sin and evil and used only the power of love to conquer it. He bore it, he absorbed it, and then he didn't just die, rather he took death into his body and then, in the resurrection, he conquered it. The resurrection doesn't, doesn't just undo the crucifixion. The resurrection fulfills the crucifixion. In the resurrection, God shows, see, here was the way to live a godly life in the world. Jesus, follow him. That's what real life is all about. Go and do likewise. And finally, when Jesus ascends to the right hand of God, then he ascends as the same one who taught peace and forgiveness and truth and mercy and love, and he died to live again to give us a path to follow. And then the third thing we're supposed to learn here is actually the real answer to my 11-year-old question. Maybe it's not such a bad question after all. Where is his body? It's not in the sky. It's not in some place called heaven. It's not still rotting in a tomb with a stone rolled in front of it. It's not mixed with the bodies of all of Rome's victims in a mass grave on the outside of Jerusalem. His body is right here. You are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He was done. He finished what only God could do, what matters most. And he gifted the rest to us. Graciously, I might add, he graciously gifted the rest to us. He graciously set us on the adventure of living with peace and forgiveness and truth and mercy and love just as he did. 
Where is his body? It's right here. Thanks be to God. In the name of the living God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the mother of us all. Amen.